Thanks for coming by, Andy. My Appreciate pleasure, it. man. Yeah. I've been watching all your content. Um, all my favorite pods, like Lex and Chris and like you've been on my uh, algorithm on like TikTok and Instagram. So you've done a good job on, <laughs> on that end. But it's like some of the most interesting information out there geopolitically in terms of like psychological tricks that you guys learn. I mean, like I've never seen anyone in that setting be so vocal and and just out there on social media. It's really cool. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting is I've also not seen it and I don't know why. Yeah. Right. Like I, I don't understand why I'm the first one with an agency background, with a military background from the, from uh, covert service. I don't know why I'm the first one to come out and speak publicly, or maybe I'm not, I'm just the first one to get enough momentum to actually get seen and heard. Uh, either way, it's, it's a privilege. Is there a reason I've seen Mike Baker a little bit, but I guess in a different context. Um, I've seen, he's been on Rogan often. And I mean, I hear a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure you see it in the comments where they say like, you never leave the CIA and people are skeptical. Like, are you still in it? Because like, it's not that you're releasing secure information. Obviously you're, like, you're careful about that, but people are skeptical and c- because there aren't many people like you doing it. Like, are you familiar with uh, Andrew Schultz? I, the, I the know comedian? the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was talking about it. I think I, I have the exact quote down. It was actually kind of funny. He goes, he's one of my favorite comics, but he goes, uh, Bustamante has to still be working for the CIA or he'd be dead. You can't go on every podcast and tell the CIA secrets and still be alive. He has to either be a part of the propaganda machine for the CIA. Like, are you ever out of the CIA? There's a comedian referencing me by name. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. I absolutely, I have to find that. I'm sure I they'll ask you to go on the show. He's awesome. He, uh, it's him and this guy, Akash Singh. And it's called Flagrant 2. They do a really oh, good job. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've got to look that up. So <laughs> so uh, the truth is that we're U.S. citizens. If we were foreigners speaking out about CIA and the U.S. government, whole different ballgame, yeah. right? But I'm a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizens carry all the rights and protections of U.S. citizens. It's one of the things that people don't understand because they get all wrapped up in conspiracy theories about America, right? They, they think that somehow U.S. citizens don't have rights. We actually do. And our rights cause a major, major logistical challenge for CIA, FBI, NSA, you name it, because you can't violate a U.S. citizen's rights. Yeah. I have a right to free speech, which means I have a right to actually say anything I want to about the federal government and they cannot take action against me. The only carve out where I'm not protected is if I disclose classified information. Mm. And even then, there's a carve out about what kind of classified information. I have to have ad, I've I have to have had access to that classified information and I have to be disclosing some piece of active source or methodology that's used by current intelligence collection capability officers. So there's a carve out of a carve out and that's if they want to take any kind of legal action on me at all. So again, going back to our original point, I don't know why I'm the first one to talk about this. Yeah. The, the the Mike Bakers of the world the vast majority of former CIA officers who have a public footprint have gone into entertainment. Mm. They've been on TV shows. They've been on, on, you know, uh, talk shows. They've been pundits for, for broadcasters like on CNN or Fox news. They haven't become independent voices themselves. Right. And Mike Baker is one of those examples. He started in TV, right? Like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He did TV shows. Really? So as and, a consultant or actually on the TV? Both as an on-screen talent. Oh, wow. So for me, I started as an independent voice and now I've been invited to be on TV shows, but it didn't go the other way around. Right. And I mean, you, you mentioned being an in, like a independent voice outside of, uh, you know, I, I guess like the mainstream media sense. And I want to thank you for that. Cause I saw your, some of your clips talking about the conflict in you know, Palestine and Israel and, and it differs greatly from what you would see on like a Fox news or a CNN and, um, you know, you just obviously being in the CIA, having real, real experience versus like theory. Cause I've taken like my, my second master's was in international public policy. Oh, that's awesome. Your second master's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's, it's something that, so I have Palestinian heritage on my father's side. I'm sorry. Then, I'm sorry for what's happening right now, man. And, and I appreciate it. I'm sorry for what your father has had to go through Yeah. for generations before anybody even really cared or noticed what was happening in Israel and Palestine? I mean, from just as a human, I think anyone who's looking at the footage, you can, you could have empathy. It's freaking, I mean, horrendous isn't even the right word for it, but obviously I have an emotional attachment. And so it's, 
it's, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to witness and experience. Like I have family living there. I've been many times and you know, you have the actual experience. So I think it carries more weight versus like some random, you know, CNN anchor woman, like, like you've, you've seen the briefings, you've been boots on the ground. So I think like, I want to thank you for just giving your perspective and like telling your truth, which mm-hmm. is really cool. I appreciate it, man. Um, I want to, there's a lot of things I want to ask you about this, but one of them being what Jocko Willink called the information battle. And, you know, especially early on, but still I'd argue that like they're losing that battle, Israel is. And it's shocking to me because, you know, it's, it's a well-oiled machine. Like they're not, it's a very, like I've heard you talk about Mossad in terms of like their capabilities and all that. How, how are they being so sloppy with it? Like, it's, it's unbelievable in terms of like either on social media, there, is it like a fog of war kind of thing? So there's a number of things happening all at once, right? So, so first, yes, there is an information war. And then let's, let's just call that layer one of the, of the multi-layer cake, right? And then on top of that, you also have this complete change in the information space compared to the last time Israel and Palestine had any kind of hot conflict. Right. I mean, we've had major changes in the information space in terms of available information, the speed of information, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, it changes every two to three years. And then you have another layer on top of that that's tied specifically to the current leadership in Israel, Netanyahu, who, I mean, he's the, he is, has been recently reelected back to being the prime minister of Israel after two other prime ministers both held terms of less than a year. So massive turnover in the leadership of Israeli politics. And it's turned over to Netanyahu, who is not a popular leader. There's a huge contingent of Israelis that don't like Netanyahu. The man's on trial. He's still under investigation for corruption, for uh, misinformation, for abuse of power. Like, he's essentially the Israeli version of Donald Trump. Mm. But I think less popular. I believe it's a 90% oh, sure. disapproval rating right yeah, now. Absolutely. But what I'm getting at is, like, he stands active charges. Yeah. And he's the prime minister of Israel at this moment in time. So it's, you got all these complexities happening at once. So, and then on top of all that, you do have the traditional fog of war where there's just so much going on. Nobody knows all the information. When you have that kind of concoction, that kind of cocktail of of disaster, that's how bad decisions get made for sure. But I think what's really important to understand about what's happening in Israel right now is that Israel is in a position where they are, to your words exactly, they are losing. They may be winning in terms of having more bombs. They may be winning in terms of more airstrikes and they may be winning in terms of of military might, but they are losing, losing international support, losing public support. They're even losing American support and they don't have many friends anywhere in the world. Yeah. So for them to lose support of their few allies is a very big deal. Meanwhile, in the Arab world, which is a massive world that nobody knows about, especially not if you're a Westerner, the the Arab world is collectively rallying behind Palestine. And more and more of the Western world is collectively rallying behind Palestine, finally coming to terms with the fact that this is a group of people who have been oppressed, rejected, discriminated against. Their human rights have been violated for decades. But before... There was never the kind of information superhighway where people could learn about it quickly and become up to speed on the content, on the the conflict itself and what had happened in Palestine. Now it's there. And I mean, you're seeing public opinion about Israel change on a day-to-day basis. It's amazing. Yeah, it's unbelievable. All right, guys, I'm going to take a quick break to tell you about what the boys over at Price Picks are cooking up for you. Price Picks is your ticket to the most exciting and straightforward way to play daily fantasy sports. It's a breath of fresh air in a world where you typically battle it out with thousands of players, including the seasoned pros and fierce sharks. Instead, at Price Picks, you get to handpick two or more players and decide whether they'll exceed or fall short of their projected stats. It's not just another fantasy game, it's a game changer. And here's something unique. Price Picks implements weekly promotions. Take Taco Tuesday, for example. Every Tuesday, they offer discounts on select player projections with savings up to 25%, providing even more value to players. Price Picks has truly transformed the way I engage with sports. It's no longer just a big college football game with national championship implications. It's also an opportunity to cash in 
talk some trash to the boys in the group chat along the way. If you're seeking quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and a vast selection of players and stat types, Prize Picks is your go to daily fantasy sports app. Head over to prizepicks.com forward slash momentum and remember to use code momentum for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right, a potential $100 bonus is waiting for you just for joining the excitement at Prize Picks. Now back to the episode. My dad's plugged in on like the TikTok world, like looking at kind of what's every or like public opinion, especially in the US. And it's it's changed so much. Like yeah. he's talking about, you know, people in the center of this country who have always sided with Israel because that's what the media tells them. And people now, you know, being aware of what's actually going on on a level that's never like like is this well, I guess Ukraine and Russia, but this is I guess one of the biggest conflicts in this social media age where there was misinformation in the past, but now people are realizing this isn't the whole picture. Like October 7th, you know, was, was obviously the terrible thing. And I wouldn't condone any civilian killing of any kind, but like, it doesn't start on the 7th. Like this is exactly late 19th century Zionism, political movement onwards to 48. Um, you know, even like one of my best friends, for example, he was, we were talking about this on the phone and, you know, like he, he grew up in the United States, has no, um, you know, claim to any of those Middle Eastern regions or anything. So, you know, it's, I don't blame him for not understanding the history of the region. But, you know, me growing up with, with uh, Palestinian heritage, I know about the history and I've read and I listen and I tried to hire my best to stay up to date. And, you know, the 1948, like Nakba is like a, to me, it was like, I thought everyone knew that. That's like, that's common knowledge. But he's like, oh, I didn't even know that happened in mm-hmm. 1948. And then I'm like, well, do you know what happened in, in this year and that year? And then these, you know, assassinations and all this. And he's like, oh, dude, I had no idea. Thank you for telling me. Like, there's so many different examples of that. And it blows my mind. Yeah, what's interesting to me is, you know, it's, uh, w- if you don't understand history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. And that's that's a famous adage that's very true and very real. But we live in a world where the reality is most people don't know history. And when it comes to really nuanced history, we, we really don't know history because of the information age that we live in. We get the, we get a benefit of not having to be historians in order to understand current tragedy. All you have to do is look at what's happening right now, unfolding on screen in front of you. And you can see the tragedy that's happening right now in the Gaza strip. You can count the bodies and you can see the difference between 1400 dead Israelis on October 7th and 13,000 dead Palestinians yesterday. Those are hugely different numbers. That's 10 times the amount of death, not even counting who it is that's actually paying the penalty of death, right? Women and children being two thirds of the people who are dying. These are this, you don't have to have the context of history to understand that this is wrong. And then you have the UN talking about war crimes, not some random country accusing war crimes, the United Nations, yeah. that's a conglomerate of countries that are basically seen as a fair and balanced force, a fair and balanced opinion of what's happening on a national and international scale. And not just now, but in the past in terms of uh, illegal actions with settlers and apartheid and occupation and essentially martial law. Um, like this isn't like just a recent thing, yeah, to I your mean, point. Yeah, exactly right. And, and again... What's nice is that you don't have to have been a historian because now once you see what's happening, it's just a search away. I mean, it's just a search away to find out that there are actual human rights violations that have been happening in the Gaza Strip and West Bank for decades. Apartheid is alive and well. Apartheid. I mean, people thought that that ended in South Africa. It's alive and well right now in the nation state of Israel in these sections that have been set aside for Palestinians. It's, It's a tragedy. But I think the larger tragedy is that the West, specifically the United States, you play pro football in the United States. I am a American veteran. I'm an American former CIA officer. We are as as red, white, and blue apple pie and hot dogs as it gets, right? And we grew up in a country that really can't tell the difference between an Israeli and a Jew. They think they're the same thing. So... To be anti-Israeli, our country as a culture thinks that if you don't support Israel, you are an anti-Semite. You don't support Judaism. 
two completely different things. Well, also Semites are Arabs too, by definition of the word, which is that's, <laughs> people don't really realize that. Because again, going back to the culture of our country, yeah. our country is, is at its core, we really do struggle with anti-Islamicism. Like yeah. we don't understand the Muslim faith. We don't understand Islam. We don't want to understand Islam. The only time that you really hear the word Islam inside the United States is when you hear Islamic extremism. Right. People don't realize outside of the borders of the United States, even inside the borders of the United States, there are giant, healthy Muslim communities that are doing amazing things. Outside of the United States, the Muslim world is a massive, massive force of international opinion, international aid, international guidance. It's just incredible. But we are, we are an insulated country. And we happen to also be the world's wealthiest country. So when you pair incredible wealth with insulated information, you end up having this, this perfect recipe for ignorance, global and international ignorance. And that's where we are. And that's what we're continually fed by a media apparatus. That's essentially a for profit business. So they're not in the media is no longer interested in telling us what's actually happening. They're interested in telling us what we want to hear so that we keep clicking, click, keep watching, yeah. you know, keep scrolling, and they keep earning money. Yeah. You mentioned the obviously the Arab states being active players in this. And we saw, you know, Hezbollah with some attacks in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen have already declared war for whatever that, that's worth. There is Iran's also a major player. Um, who knows what Saudi is going to do. But like when you look at all this, like what do you make of it in terms of any kind of, obviously it's going to be difficult, but any kind of projection moving forwards in terms of possible outcomes? Yeah, well, I think one of, so at the core of all of this, there's it's impossible not to see Iran at the core of all of this conflict. Iran carries out their foreign policy through proxies. Mm. And their three primary proxies are the Houthis in Yemen, the Hezbollah group in Lebanon, and the Hamas group in Palestine. So you've got all three proxies for Iran, all coordinating attacks against Israel. Yeah. That is 100% Iran is behind all of that. The bigger question becomes why? Why? Why would Iran, a country that's, and, and Iran is wealthy. Again, Americans don't understand this. Iran is a wealthy, sophisticated agricultural bread basket of all of the Arab world. So there is no Arab country that doesn't trade with Iran because Iran is the best place to get your cucumbers, your carrots, your bell peppers, your breads. Iran is a, is a bread basket. It's a fantastic, amazing place that we in the United States think is some sort of like, you know, third world yeah. cesspool that doesn't have anything going for it. No. Yeah. The perception of, of these countries are insane. <laughs> it, it's literally unbelievable. I was in, um, Jordan and in Amman. And I mean, I know you've been in like a lot of the Emirates and like you've been, I heard you listen, uh, listen to you on podcasts talking about like you were stationed there and all yeah, that. Yeah. It's like, you would know, obviously, but I mean, you wouldn't, um, you would think you're in any Western big city. Like you would have zero clue. A lot of the even signs are all in English. Yeah. Like if you just dropped me there right now, if I walked out of the studio, I'd be like, Oh, I'm in LA. Yeah. yeah I'd yeah. have zero clue. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> so, so Iran, is the one kind of masterminding this thing. But why? Why are they supporting the Houthis? Why are they or why are they supporting Hamas in carrying out an attack that happened on October 7th? What's the specific trigger for that? And I think a lot of that ties back to the Abraham Accords, which have been going on for about the last four or five years, which is this outreach effort by Israel to make uh, trade relations, foreign relations, diplomatic relations with the Arab world, which has never existed before. Now, the work for the Abraham Accords actually started before Netanyahu was in office. So it's not his baby. It's the effort of multiple leading politicians in Israel to say, hey, we need to stop being at odds with the Islam, the Muslim world. We need to start finding a way to, to build closer ties with the Muslim world. So they built ties with Bahrain first. And then they moved on and they made diplomatic relations with UAE. I mean, these are major players in the Khaliji Arab world, Khaliji Arabs being the oil-rich Arab countries. So they're making these gains, making these inroads. And the next one on the docket was Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the wealthiest, the largest, the most well-respected Khaliji country of all the Khaliji nations in the Gulf. So to make diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia a reality basically means Oman, Qatar, Jordan, everybody else is going to follow suit. 
That didn't happen. It was literally within days of the Abraham Accord being signed between Israel and Saudi Arabia that the attack happened from Hamas into Israel. Mm -hmm. Sponsored by Iran, what they did is they drove a giant wedge between any successful diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel because the number one provider, the number one supporter of Palestinian freedom and Palestinian statehood in the world is Saudi Arabia. So to have this conflict between Israel and Palestine, to have Palestinians systematically being killed like they are, there's no way Saudi Arabia is going to make peace through the Abraham Accords with Israel, watching Israel do this to the, the people they have protected and they have, uh, they have championed and sponsored for so long. So Iran successfully has driven a wedge now between the Arab world and the Jewish world which is to drive a wedge between the Arab world and the West. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, that, that makes, that makes total sense. But what are the odds that Netanyahu knew about it? And like, I'll, I'll read you this quote that you said about Mossad and I know Mossad's, you know, I suppose it's different than IDF, but I'd also suppose that there's similar ideologies with that. You've got three players. You've got Mossad, you've got the IDF and you have Shin Bet. Okay. Right. So, but go ahead and let's go through your quote because I, I do think it's worth exploring. Yeah. So you, you said this on Lex Friedman's pod, quote, Mossad will do anything. Mossad has no qualms doing what it takes to ensure the survival of every Israeli citizen around the world. Most other countries will stop at some point, but Mossad doesn't do that. And when I think of one of the greatest surveillance states the earth has ever seen and, you know, to me, like Hamas's capabilities I, I don't know if they're capable of doing that on their own. I mean, I just don't. For sure they're not, yeah. Yeah. And then when you throw in what you were talking about with Netanyahu's unpopularity, someone who's potentially facing prison, someone who's been in power for 16 years and obviously very power hungry, corrupt, willing to do anything to stay in power. Now, there's elements of a conspiracy there. I've, I've also heard you talk about conspiracies in terms of all there needs to be is one kernel of truth and there's a gap between that and then rationalizing what happened. Yep. With this, I feel like there's a few kernels though. For sure. There's like the, the $500 billion worth of gas there is problematic. There's the Ben Gurion canal that they've been trying to build. That's a huge player in that as well. Um, the leaked document suggesting that Netanyahu has been pr uh, propping up Hamas throughout all this time. I mean, you can go down the list. There's, there's the elements exist there. Now, obviously, like I'm not there, so I have no clue and, and nobody really knows. But I think it's worth investigating. I love how informed you are on this topic, man, because you, you are exactly in that place where nine people like you out of 10 would have already landed on a conclusion based on the conspiracy. You are just saying there's all this information but I also understand how conspiracy works. Yeah. So you haven't landed on a, on a conclusion yet, which is super important, man, because that's the difference between an amateur, what we call an armchair analyst, and a professional analyst. We have to constantly fight the information that makes us want to leap to conclusions and create a conspiracy. So what we have here is a, like you said, multiple kernels of truth. We have, uh, in, we have lots of information. We also have lots of gaps in the information. Yeah. It's the gaps that m are the most important. As long as you recognize that there isn't a logical way to connect point A with point C, because we don't know what happened in B, as long as you recognize there's a gap there, you don't have to make a conclusion. You can talk about probabilities, you can talk about possibilities, you can talk about opportunities, but you don't land on a conclusion. It makes all the difference in the world, man, yeah. when you don't land on a conclusion. Because when you start, when you start deciding, concluding based on missing information, you're not helping anybody. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping the world. Yeah. So you're exactly right. And I've heard this conspiracy, dude, October 8th. Oh yeah. Was the first <laughs> day that I heard the conspiracy where people were like, Netanyahu knew about this. He let it happen because he needed an enemy and yada, yada, yada. Could that have happened? Absolutely. That could right. have happened. We have no evidence to prove that it happened. And in my experience working in the United States, the United States would never let American citizens be hurt intentionally just to gain the opportunity to attack a foe. It would never happen. 
because besides you can Northwoods. You can with, rationalize anything into a reason for conflict, right? You can. Yeah. You can rationalize anything that you need to. Economic threats, military threats, developmental threats. I mean, the United States, the the Special Forces Command is is a entity of the military that's designed to engage in conflict even when there is no grounds for war. Like that's what their job is. So literally the United States, the president uh, all the way up to like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they can just decide to execute operations pretty much anywhere in the world as long as there's some sort of even loose justification that it ties back to national security priorities. And they'll find a sponsor somewhere in the Senate or they'll find a sponsor somewhere in the, in the House or the president can unilaterally execute CIA's covert action arm to do whatever he wants to with a presidential, a presidential finding. So we don't need to have Americans die in order for us to take action. So it's a huge misnomer to me whenever, whenever whoever anybody tries to justify that a conspiracy included the, the loss of innocent life in order to justify conflict, we don't need it. So it doesn't make any sense that that would happen. But that's when you're talking about the U.S. In terms Correct. of Israel, like in terms of your quote on Mossad, you said most other countries will stop at some point, but Mossad doesn't do it. And then we also know about the Hannibal Directive in which, you know, they're willing to kill their own civilians in order to neutralize a threat. So, like, so let's talk about Mossad yeah. because this is, this is interesting or this is an important point, right? Mossad and Shin Bet are the equivalent of CIA and FBI in the United States. Shin Bet is internal security, internal counterintelligence and law enforcement, just like FBI. CIA and Mossad are external intelligence collection, right? So Mossad's focus, Mossad's objective is outside of Israel. Mm. That's where they focus. They, they really, they, I, I don't understand it, uh, I don't understand Israeli law well enough to know whether Mossad has any jurisdiction inside Israel, but CIA has no jurisdiction inside the United States. And our two services are modeled off of each other yeah. because we helped contribute to the development of Israel. Right. Right. So Mossad is an external action arm of intelligence. So that's where their cruelty and their viciousness comes from because wherever they operate, they're operating where the whole deck is stacked against them. They're, one or two officers operating in a foreign land where if they get caught, they're being tortured, they're being killed, they're being tried and sentenced for life. So they are, they are just not reckless, but they are, I mean, they have no limits as to what they will do to rescue, save, and protect Israeli citizens outside of Israel. Yeah. But inside of Israel, Mossad doesn't have that kind of power. That's Shin Bet. And Shin Bet has just as crazy of a reputation as Mossad does and they are not known. They are not spoken about. People don't recognize that Shin Bet is as well-funded and well-trained and just as, as controversially violent as Mossad is, only they operate against internal threats. Because Israel is a country that has multiple uh, foreign threats that have claimed the destruction and the demise of all of Israel, right? The destruction of the country and the identity of Israel, that's a true existential threat. Yeah. So Shin Bet has to approach their work through the eyes of protecting against an existential threat. So that makes them incredibly vicious and aggressive and assertive. The group that would be responsible for identifying a threat from Hamas against the homeland would be Shin Bet. Mm. The force that would then be called upon to execute a counteroffensive would be the IDF, the Defense Force, the military yeah. of Israel, right? So when it comes to the intelligence failure of this specific conflict, all three, well, two of the three play a role. IDF doesn't really play a role. I'm sure there's a military intelligence wing, but Hamas doesn't really have a military. Right. They have a militant yeah. wing that kind of relies on terrorist tactics, but they don't really have a formal standing military. So Mossad would have been charged with collecting information on Hamas. Shin Bet would have been charged with analyzing and acting upon Mossad's information to protect the homeland somewhere in that realm this specific attack, the details of the October 7th attack were not discovered. And that's just two forces. We're not even talking about signals intelligence. We're not talking about open source intelligence. We're not talking about measurements intelligence that, you know, all these other ints that would have been active in Israel. Yeah. But just because the attack was a success does not mean that the intelligence apparatus failed, right? Think of it like, think of it like secrets, Right. That's it's all intelligence is. It's a, it's a game of collecting secrets. If you know something 
and I don't know it. Let's just say it's the how much money you have in your primary checking account. Mm -hmm. You know how much money you have in your checking account. I don't know that. Most people don't know that. That makes it a secret. Yeah. You know it. Your bank knows it. That's it. Is it an intelligence failure on my part for not knowing your bank account? No. It's just a well-kept secret on your part. Now, if you text your balance to your girlfriend and then she writes in an email to her mom and I have a way of hacking into their email accounts, if I still miss that bank account, now it's an intelligence failure because I can access, I can access those. I'm not going to be able to break through your brain and I'm not going to be able to break into the security system of your bank, but I can potentially hack into your girlfriend's Google account, yeah. right? That makes it an intelligence failure. The information has to be accessible and then information and then the intelligence agencies have to fail to collect it and fail to analyze it in order for it to be an intel failure. From everything that we've heard about how Hamas planned this attack, it was literally done on scraps of paper and in-person meetings, mm. meaning there were only a few people who knew when, how, and to what extent the attack would be carried out. So maybe Mossad or maybe Shin Bet knew an attack was coming, but they didn't know it would attack on it would happen day. on October 7th. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to take a quick second to tell you about Price Picks, the ultimate destination for daily fantasy sports. Price Picks has made this football season the most thrilling one yet. Forget battling it out with the pros and sharks. With Price Picks, you're just up against the numbers. I've personally had a blast playing prize picks and it's so simple. In less than 60 seconds, I can make my picks and submit my entry and it's truly a game changer. You get to select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats and just like that, you're in the game. Speaking from my own experience, I've debated countless times with the boys how the Pac-12 isn't overrated. Now I can put my money where my mouth is and turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. It's incredibly exciting to test your skills on price picks and see how far you can go. And if that's not enough, price picks offers quick withdrawals and an enormous selection of players and stat types. So here's the deal. Go to prizepicks.com forward slash momentum and use code momentum for a first deposit match up to $100. Yep, that's right. Up to $100 for just joining the action on prize picks. Enjoy the episode. In terms of the threat of nuclear war, you've you've been in charge of uh, an arsenal Is that in Montana, right? Correct, yeah. When you, when you see something like this unfold and, and all the major players... All, it seems like all the ingredients are there and it just all that it requires is, is, is one spark or like one wrong move. And, you know, even it's, it's fascinating, the concept that like I listened to Dan, do you know Dan Carlin? The he's like a hist, he's not a historian technically, but he has a really cool podcast and, and he kind of goes in depth. Like it's like these six hour series on like certain points of history. And I'm like kind of like a history nerd esque. <laughs> and, and I got into the, the big, uh, the, the nuclear rabbit hole after I saw Oppenheimer, as I'm sure a lot of people did. And he had this crazy six part series about it, kind of like Manhattan Project on through like a uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And he mentioned after Stalin, there was a moment and like, I suppose the closest we've been to nuclear war outside of like Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the, uh, the president at the time in Russia, they incorrectly saw on the radar. Do you know about this? I heard it, yep. Yeah, and then um, you know, he was about to strike back, but he said, let's let us let cooler minds prevail, let's wait, and then ended up being incorrect, obviously. But like, I wonder how many close instances there have been of that. That's just one reported one. And you know, Israel having nuclear weapons, Iran, you know, China, Russia, even North Korea, like, potent, like wanting to help Hamas and, and Palestine. Like, how close are we, do you think, to something? And is this the closest we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is, this is where it's important to remember that all the conflict is being sponsored. All the conflict is being sponsored. Thus far. And it, going forward. So you're, you're saying it's going to stay a proxy, but even if it is proxy, everyone knows it's Iran. Correct. But that doesn't, mess, that doesn't mean Iran has publicly accepted responsibility for it. Do they have to? To, to make it a state, to, uh, to make it an official state action, a state has to claim responsibility, just okay. like you saw Russia do with their attack on Ukraine, right? And let's not also forget that Israel, Israel is also serving as a proxy right now. To the U.S. Bingo, right? So Israel's acting on their own volition, but they're being financially sponsored. They're being uh, uh, 
militarily sponsored by the United States, just like Ukraine is being sponsored by the United States. So there's two proxies at conflict here. Israel is a proxy for the West and uh, Hamas as a proxy for Iran. Yeah. And there's whole networks that go behind that, right? Because if you're being sponsored by Iran, who are Iran's closest military and diplomatic peers? Russia and China, right? So you can see how the network spider. The teams have already been formed, yeah. And that's that's my biggest concern. Right. That's the the big glaring exclamation point at this point in history. The teams are being formed. The yeah. last time teams were formed like this was World War II. Axis powers and allied powers. Mm. We're seeing the same thing happen now on an economic scale. The countries that con that contribute to the BRICS trading bloc, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, has gone on to include Iran, has gone on to include UAE, has gone on to include, uh, then try to include Saudi Arabia. Like that is a team. And then you've got your UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe. You know, France, yeah. Germany, and, and even on the Western side, there's dysfunction because France doesn't really know if it wants to stay allies with the United States. Germany has already declared that they no longer want the United States to be part of NATO. They mm -hmm. want to have their own strong military so that they can stop making decisions as NATO based on what the United States tells them to do. Yeah. So there's fracturing happening in Europe with their relationship with the United States. Now, the reason I say all that is because if you understand the sponsorship of the conflict, then you start to understand the value of the conflict. The value of this conflict, just like the value of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, is that it continues. If it stops, if there's a winner declared, then the sponsors lose their tool. Right now, they have a diplomatic tool. As long as Russia is continuing to fight Ukraine and Ukraine's continuing to fight Russia, as long as Hamas is fighting Israel and Israel's fighting Hamas, as long as these two things are happening, the sponsors have diplomatic power over each other, right? China has a reason to be in the newspaper every day, protecting Palestinians, trying to negotiate peace in Ukraine, you know, blah, 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 blah. The same thing happens to the United States. The United States has a reason to be vocal every day without ever being seen as the aggressor, right? Essentially, China and the United States get to be innocent, mature big brothers trying to find a resolution while these petty arguments turn into unnecessary lives lost. That's the game. That's the real game here. Wealthy countries get poor countries to carry out their conflicts. Mm -hmm. What does war look like in, in a country itself? It's senior officers who make the most getting junior enlisted people who make the least to fight and die in conflict. Right. It's just a macro reflection of what we see on a micro level. What is professional sports? It's young, healthy people making less money than the owners of the teams who are old, wealthy people. Yeah. It's just that's what happens. Seniority and wealth dictates the terms for the young and the hungry. Like I, I understand the concept of the proxies, but you know, the information, oh, like everyone knows that, like all the countries in the U in the Middle East, they know that the U.S. is sponsoring it. And like Iran and Hezbollah, or no, I believe, yeah, the Houthis have been bombing like U.S. military because they know they're sponsoring them. So it's like, who are you really fooling? And at what point is, if the U.S. gets involved directly, I mean, they already kind of are. I mean, I guess the broader question is, like, what's the potential for, for a broader conflict in, like, World War III, quote, unquote? So I would argue that World War III has already started. That World War III is a proxy war. It's an economic war that drives proxy conflict. World War II was old school tanks and planes and fire, you know, uh, bombing campaigns and nuclear threats and shutting, you know, that was World War II. World War I was chemical warfare and digging trenches and people dying in the cold, right? The Vietnam War looked different. The Korean War looked different. War evolves from season to season. The current evolution of war is what we have seen in Syria, what we have seen is in uh, 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 Yemen, what we have seen in Afghanistan, what we have seen in Iraq, right? It's this, it's this proxy conflict and it's, it's ugly, but it's happening. And it's a world that is contributing to the conflict. So people are afraid that World War III is going to involve nuclear weapons. Yeah. 
Nuclear weapons were a World War II objective. Well, but one country had it at the time. Multiple countries were trying to develop it. Right. And then what happened is after the United States used them in Japan, they used them in a traditional tactical manner, right, where they dropped massive bombs on the epicenters of, of military industrial uh, uh, com- capability mm-hmm. and shut Japan down. But they also killed hundreds of thousands of innocent lives. And they made a giant uh, impact crater on history to show like war crimes, to show human rights violations, to show that the United States, who is a democracy that promotes, you know, freedom, equality, human rights, and legality, is willing to break their own rules to win in a conflict. Now that there's been a spread of nuclear weapons, what that means is it creates something called parity. Yeah which is the most useful thing about nuclear weapons. It means that now Russia gets a chance to continue its campaign in Ukraine because it has parity with the United States. Mm -hmm. So the United States can't swoop in and support Ukraine without risking the escalation on the part of Russia. Mutually insured destruction. Mutually insured destruction or what's it's, uh, there's a, a term, I'm losing it right now. There's an analytical term. We call it a paradox. Yeah, the paradox that there's more of it, so it makes it less likely that countries would be willing to use. Correct, correct. The security paradox. There you go. Right? More people have security, which makes it less likely that people are going to escalate using the maximum means of their security. However, the flip side to that is that the more security one country gains, it actually encourages and inspires its uh, its opponent to meet and exceed its level of security. Mm. So the United States developed nuclear weapons. Well, now all of the now all of the adversaries for the United States had to also develop nuclear weapons. So China developed nuclear weapons, and Russia developed nuclear weapons. Now Iran is trying to, and North Korea is trying to, right? The idea that Israel has nuclear weapons this is one of those areas where publicly they're that not is supposed an, to, right? That is an unanswered question. There are classified channels that know the answer to that question, but just to your point, when you say everybody knows. That's not really true. Mm. It means that there is a narrative out there. There's information available to people that make them believe something is true, but there is no smoking gun. There is no solid proof that Israel has nuclear weapons. To my knowledge, the the possession of, of Israel having nuclear weapons at all is a tightly guarded classified secret. I don't know if they have it. If I did know if they have it, I wouldn't confirm it or not or deny it. But I know that it has not been publicly confirmed that they have nuclear weapons. I believe I read there was an official, and perhaps it's metaphor. Perhaps he slipped out of his uh, slipped out of his mouth. But he was talking about the rhetoric of let's just nuke them, and so that I mean I don't know what that means necessarily. But like my concern, when we we're talking about the parity and the mutually insured destruction and all that. My concern is that a, a state like Israel. I mean, I suppose it could be anybody. If you if you're the prime minister and you see that you're going down, what are the odds that you just hey everyone's going down with me? That's like that's my big concern. Yeah. I if think, I'm already going down, it's like hey you guys are going to feel my wrath too. So let's put you in those real shoes. If you were actually a prime minister and you were actually guilty of corruption and you were actually guilty of fraud, like Netanyahu is being accused of, would you actually let your entire country? Would you let all of your countrymen die? including your family, including your, your children, your grandchildren, would you actually sacrifice them all to protect yourself? I obviously would not, but... I, you obviously would not. Why do we feel like we can assume that that is exactly what someone else would do? Because he's done things that I would never fathom of doing. But the thing is, human beings are all coded the same way. We are coded for survival. We are coded for not only our survival, but the survival of our progeny. That's really what drives human beings. It's not about us. It's about the generations that follow us. So it's impossible to look at somebody and say, well, you are a bad guy. So you would kill everybody in your family gladly to protect yourself. That is a, that is a conspiracy, right? That's a missing kernel of information. But does that apply when we all have clear heads and thinking when there's no conflict? Or we were talking about fog of war before when you're making irrational decisions. Because I agree with you. It's not a rational decision to do so by any stretch. But people are making irrational decisions during war. I mean, it's like it's uh, even if you apply to football, which is totally different, but still like you, you see dudes making uncharacteristic decisions and mistakes all the time. But those are happening on an individual level. 
the team itself yes. is comprised of multiple individuals. And there's a hierarchy that makes it so that cooler heads can prevail, which is why you can get pissed off as, you know, someone on the offensive line, but the coach ultimately controls the offensive line. And then there's, there's protocols that, that have even higher levels of authority over individual players. The same thing happens in military conflict. So Netanyahu might want to whatever, nuke them all, who knows what, mm -hmm. but he still has a, a, a governing body that has to agree. He still has generals that have to agree. He still has a, you know, a, a legislative organization above him that has to support that and pay the, pay the funds for that, right? Not to mention the fact that he's got allies like the United States that if he does something that's, that's too overboard, he runs the risk of cutting off his primary source of support. We were talking about the question as to whether a nation does or doesn't have nuclear weapons and public perception and all that. I want to ask you, like you being tied in your past to like presidential briefings and having security clearances and all this, what is the gap between what's true and what civilians have access to and what's actually going on? Huge. It's a huge gap. Yeah. I'm, it, I wonder that all the time. Yeah. It's a huge gap and it's, it's there for a multitude of reasons, right? So first of all, real secrets, like the things that, that keep intelligence officers awake at night are incredibly boring. People don't realize it. Mm. Like real secrets are, are very, very boring. They're technical. They're complicated. They're, uh, they're um, not specific because they're, they're nebulous. They're very boring things where, you know, people want to know who killed JFK. Right. That's exciting. And that's, that's not really how a secret works. A secret doesn't say, Oh, JFK's killer was X, Y, Z. It's more like, well, the secrets that we know that we can't tell you about are, you know, the bullet that was found in this building, in this wall, in this direction that suggests it was shot from this other place, right? That's the kind of stuff that's actually secret. Yeah. Like you think about what people really want secrets about. They want secrets about weapons. They want secrets about troop movements. They want secrets about, uh, about technology and, and intellectual property. That's incredibly boring stuff. Like oodles and oodles of new of paper that tells you the specific specifications of a silent engine, uh, submarine nuclear reactor. That's Nobody makes movies about that. Right. Real secrets are really quite boring. So a big part of the reason there's such a big gap between what civilians know and what's really happening is because the, the majority of that chunk is boring techno babble that nobody wants to know anyways, right? Like how does your electric oven work? Nobody really knows until it breaks and they go to YouTube and they get frustrated that they can't find the one YouTube video that they need to fix their oven. Because your oven is actually kind of complicated. Your refrigerator is actually kind of complicated, right? Even your toilet is kind of complicated. People know ah, there's a plunger and there's a, a flop, but that's all that they really know. Yeah, but presumably there's big stuff as well too. Like I understand maybe 98% of it's, it's the small niche, you know, minutia, but there's got to be some big stuff there too. Yeah, there's big stuff too, but the big stuff is buried in the small stuff. And and on top of that, then there's also the availability of information. Remember how we were talking about like really well-kept secrets? Yeah. There are always well-kept secrets. The intelligence isn't, it gets, it's a word that gets confused because in everyday vernacular, intelligence literally means what you know, right? You are an intelligent person because you know a lot. In the professional world of intelligence, intelligence is actually a term that's used to talk about what you don't know. So if you know a secret, then it's technically not intelligence. It is now a known fact. Intelligence, in my terminology, intelligence in, in, in the world of espionage means a probability-based assessment that's derived from available information. It's still just a probability, which means it's not known for sure, Yeah. right? If I know your exact height, then it's a fact. It's not intelligence. If I derive and guess what your height is based on several pictures of you where you stand next to different known celebrities and I'm estimating that you're approximately six foot four, that could be intelligence because it's derived from information, but it's not known for sure. Yeah. Are there things that you know that you're not allowed to say potentially that would shock the civilian population. Absolutely. That, but that's not just me. That's, I mean, there are people with low level secret clearances that did, that do low level jobs in the military that know things that would shock the average person. Mm. 
Yeah. And that's, again, it's because of what you're privileged to know and because of what you learn in the job. But and again, talking about the gap between what civilians know and what the reality is, a big part of that is that civilians get really wrapped up in what they think they know. Yeah. And they oftentimes overlook the, the simple truth that they could derive on their own. It's called Occam's razor, yeah. right? Oftentimes the simplest answer is the correct answer. Yeah. That's really interesting. Like, so when you were operating and like you turn on the news, for example, are you just laughing? You're like, are oh, you guys have that completely wrong? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. When, funny. when you're, when you're uh, actively employed at CIA and you're actively what we call a, a staff officer, when you are a staff officer, you have incredible amounts of information that you're it's available to you. It's, there's the stuff that you're read into, read into meaning you have the privileged access to know the, the most secret elements of it. But then there's also other areas where you have the correct classification to be able to read in, but it's not super relevant to you. So you essentially have like a whole new level of newspaper when you, and we call it cable traffic. So you can just browse cable traffic and see what's happening in the whole world. Wow. And then you also know deep knowledge about the area where you're read in. Yeah. So for sure at CIA, there's a lot of times where you watch, <laughs> you watch CNN or, or Fox news or BBC or whatever on your way into the office and you're like, oh, I wonder what's really happening there. And then you get into the office and you see the classified channels and you're like, they don't know what they're talking about. That's so funny. I, I mean, I guess it applies <laughs> to everything in, in sports, which is my world. You know, you talk about uh, like rumors with the coaching staff or players and like you're not actually in those meetings. Like like people don't realize that that's not actually what's happening. Like, the, And I don't know, if I had to sign a percentage, maybe it'd be like 40, 45 percent of mm -hmm. it's like accurate but like as players like people send you articles and you're like you don't, i don't even open it. it's like dude like that's that's just so off <laughs> yes you know and it's just it's an interesting concept here's here's what i've discovered is so depressing um enlightening i don't you, you choose the word right yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about americans I'll, I'll talk specifically about westerners people who speak english who fall under a rule of law or a country that's judicious right we are conditioned from a very young age to believe in rules, rules and guide and guidelines and boundaries, right? When you go bowling, you want to hit the pins. If you go into the gutter, you have failed. Yeah. In football, people can do amazing things on the field, but they only count as amazing if they follow the rules. Yeah. If you make an amazing catch outside of bounds, Nobody talks about that in the highlight reel. Right. They only talk about it if you do something amazing within the confines of the rules of the game. The same thing is true in basketball. The same thing is true in soccer. The same thing is true in academics. So we're conditioned to follow the rules and play by the rules and do amazing things within the box of the rules. In real life, the thing that excites us the most is when you get away with breaking the rules. So in war... There are no rules. There is a criminal court. There is a, there is a rule of, of uh, or a law of war. There are guidance and, and confines. There's, there's yeah. trials that happen, but there are no rules. So people get so discouraged when they feel like the rules of war are being broken. And people get so excited when they feel like they have found a way to cheat the rules yeah. outside of our day-to-day -day life. That creates what's called cognitive dissonance in the human brain. Is it better to follow the rules or is it better to break the rules, right? And what most people will say is, well, you have to follow the rules, but you can break the rules if the rules are unfair to you. Mm. That doesn't make any sense, right? So like the thing that blows my mind about the average person is that they want other people to follow the rules, but they want themselves to be allowed to break the rules. Yeah. How does that make any sense? And what kind of civilization, what kind of society is that going to breed? If your expectation of everyone else is that they're not allowed to have secrets, but your expectation of yourself is that you are. And your expectation of everyone else is that you have to play by the rules. And your expectation of yourself is, I don't. Everybody's having the same expectation. And that's going to lead to the continual challenge and the continual dissolvement of what we are seeing in our society. What's the protocol for a captured spy or covert intelligence officer? There's a couple of different protocols. Um, 
The first one is that you don't, you never, you never give up your cover because your cover is the one thing that you have that creates what's called plausible deniability or a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. And that shadow of a doubt is a very important thing. Again, going back to when you were, you were earlier talking about how, you know, everybody knows this is happening. Everybody knows Iran is behind this. What is the, the more accurate term is there's confidence, but there's still a shadow of a doubt. Mm. So for us, a shadow of a doubt is the thing that can keep you alive. Because if you're arrested in a foreign country for committing acts of espionage, there's a good chance they've surveilled you, they've collected information about you, they have evidence that will withstand a court of law in the country where you've been arrested. So whether that's Egypt or whether that's Paris or whether that's, you know, Argentina, wherever it is, you most likely have met the threshold to be arrested according to their national laws. But they don't have enough to convict you with total certainty because something about your cover still holds up. So it's that shadow of doubt that you have to preserve to give your own home country enough time that they can negotiate for your release, that they can engage diplomatic channels, whatever else it might be. So you protocol number one is you never acknowledge, you never admit that you are a covert intelligence officer. You never do it. We call it a, a big red self-destruct button Yeah. because all of your interrogations, interrogations of covert intelligence officers, the first two or three rounds of interrogation are nothing like the movies because the first two or three rounds of interrogation are really, they sit you in a nice chair, they bring you some nice food, some nice drink, and they're like, look, you've done a good job. <laughs> We get that you're professionally trained. We don't want to cause an international incident. We just need you to admit that you are here on behalf of CIA or you are here on behalf of, you know, BND or you are here on behalf of whatever the, the service might be. Yeah. Just admit it so we can get you home and you can leave our country and we'll be fine. And it's a lie. It's a lie. Mm. But when you're sitting there and you're like, oh, shit, I got caught. You feel this giant red button where you're like, oh, sweet, let me just press the button, easy button, and yeah. I'm out of here, yeah. right? But that's not how it's going to work. So one of the first things they train us is that's not how it's going to work. Never press the big red button. So you sit there until you're blue in the face defending your cover. But largely the reason is because you can survive a court system or if there is no court system. Like what if you're in, you know, say, North Korea and you're being tortured or something like that? Like is it like how... Do, are, are you guys prepared for situations like that? The protocol there becomes something totally different because now what you're getting into is, is seer training, survival, escape, resistance, and, and evasion. You're getting to a position where you have to escape mm. because there is no court system. So if there is no court system, there is no legal protection, there is no international umbrella, there will never be a moment where your yeah. diplomatic channels can kick in. So you still defend your cover, but then you start what's called degrading your cover. You start degrading your cover because you start using advanced techniques to help secure your release or secure your escape. You know, the, the average uh, tire manufacturing president doesn't know how to pick their way out of handcuffs and doesn't know how to, you know, strangle somebody with a proper chokehold. Mm. That's not something that your average executive knows how to do. That is something that a field trained operative who's going into a denied area would know how to do. So if you're caught doing those things, you have now degraded your cover, but there's still a shadow of a doubt that maybe you're not a spy. Maybe you just took jujitsu or maybe you got yeah. lucky or maybe you watched a YouTube video. Yeah. They still don't know for sure. So you always defend your cover. Is there anything with pain tolerance that you guys go through in terms of torture or any kind of specific torture techniques that are the worst kinds? When it comes to receiving, receiving pain, that is something that we are taught to do, but it's not the way that you might think. So your military operators are trained essentially through what's called stress inoculation. They're introduced and they're, they're, they sample different types of torture techniques, whether that's sleep deprivation or whether that's some kind of water torture or whether that's actual strikes, right? Kicks and, and punches and slaps and, and starvation. So your military members will go through stress inoculation. What happens at the agency is they teach us the concepts that drive pain mm. and where pain actually comes from so that we can understand pain. Because a big part of the difference between your intelligence training and your standard military training is that military training teaches you what to do. Intelligence training teaches you why it works. Because if you understand why something works, you can apply it in a, a range of different uh, avenues, a, a number of different scenarios. The military doesn't really know that they have the 
intelligence quotient in their people to teach them all why, but they do know they can teach them all what. So CIA knows they have the intelligence quotient to teach you why. So that's a huge difference in our training. It's also why military members go through two or three years of training. Mm. CIA goes through about six months of training before they're field deployed. So where does pain come from? So pain is all based on your nerve endings. You have different types of nerve endings. And depending on what your nerve endings in your fingers, your arms, your, your, your skull, depending on what types of, uh, of sensory inputs your nerve endings are getting, it starts to your brain programs your nerve endings to become accustomed to those. So for example, if you've ever, ever put your hand into cold water, mm -hmm. if you're somewhere warm and you stick your hand in cold water, how does it feel? Good. It hurts. Oh, if you're somewhere, well, if it's hot outside and I put my hand in Ice cold, cold water, water, it's going to be better than if I'm in cold temperature. No, it no? actually won't. Yes. Okay. Because what's happening is. But I if, think like if I go sauna to cold tub, I feel better. Well, that's because you're a little twisted because you're a professional athlete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the average person would not agree with that. Okay. So, so if you, you know, people can do this at home. If they create a bowl of water and in that bowl of water, they pour water and they pour ice and they let it sit, say five minutes, let your room, your, let your hand sit at room temperature, right? And then you plunge your hand into the cold water. Now, what happens is as soon as you hit that cold water, it hurts, it stings, it aches, it burns. How does cold water burn? Mm. It happens because your nerve endings in your hand have been coded by your brain to receive ambient air temperature as average. I can take the same hand out of my 72 degree house and I can stick it in a 105 degree jungle. And guess what's going to happen? My brain will code my nerve endings to feel like 105 degrees is totally normal mm -hmm. and there won't be any pain. But if I take my 105 degree hand and I stick it in the same cold water, it will hurt more because what pain receptors are doing is they're measuring the difference between what your skin determines to be average and the new, the new sensory inputs that it's receiving. Okay. So the wider the gap between the two, the more pain is received. Okay. So the reason that we used advanced interrogation techniques at CIA was because we were able to simulate the gap of normal to painful mm. without actually creating permanent pain. How so? Because something like waterboarding. Waterboarding is you go from normal, normal breathing, to challenged breathing. The person isn't actually at risk of drowning unless the waterboarder is doing Incompetent. something wrong. Yeah. Right? So you're able to actually protect the person's health without sacrificing the simulation that they're drowning. So they get the same gap from normal to pain. And that's really where pain exists is in the gap between, between what's normal and what you're experiencing. So they can simulate the gap, which means they can simulate the panic. They can simulate the pain without actually causing permanent damage. It's another reason why, to your point, if you're skiing mm -hmm. and you're outside and it's 15 degrees and you pull out your hand, your hand, as it comes out of the glove, will feel the cold five, 10 minutes later, it won't, mm -hmm. but it'll still work. Yeah. If you plunge that hand into ice water that's yeah. 25 degrees, that water is going to feel warm. Mm, yeah. Because your hand had become accustomed to it's a relative 15. to what it was before. But it won't feel uncomfortable or painful. Yeah. Now, if you stick that same hand into a pot of 80 degree water, it will hurt. Yeah. Because your hand has become accustomed to, f you know, 15 degrees. And now it's taking a 70 degree jump. So they waterboard you guys in training to like see how it feels? No, they just tell us the why. They tell us why it works and, and how it works. Because for so it's us, just mind over matter then at that point. That's all it is. Really? That's all it is. That's what they need us to understand for wow. two reasons. One, no matter what our enemy throws at us, if we understand that the enemy stands to win only as long as we are alive. Yeah then we know the enemy won't kill us. Physical pain is a crazy thing, though. It is. Like if you're ripping limbs and fingers off, like... And that's what you see in, like, Vietnam and stuff, right? When they're taking off fingernails and they're putting bamboo shoots underneath your nails. Oof. There's nothing you can do to make the pain stop. Yeah. The only thing you can do is understand what the pain is and why the pain is happening. Yeah. Right? And for us... That's... So you feel like you can undergo, like, almost any kind of physical pain and kind of... You'll be way better off than almost anyone else just because you understand this. So I, I feel like I have an opportunity. Yeah. It will still hurt just like it hurts anybody else. Yeah. But the opportunity I have is to understand what is going to happen next, hmm. right? If an organized criminal gang kidnaps me and starts torturing me, I don't know what they want. 
I will literally be afraid that the next thing they do will kill me. If the Chinese MSS kidnaps me and they take me to Beijing, I'm less afraid that they're going to kill me. They may make me hurt a lot in the process, but they really stand to gain by keeping me alive. How paranoid are you either when you were an operative or even at any point of double agents or agents trying to influence you? Like, how do you know, like, neither of us are agents? Well, I, I, I don't know whether or not the actual engineer is an agent or not. Outside of the fact that he did struggle with the cameras. <laughs> so that was, that was helpful. <laughs> but that could, be, uh, that could be deception. Could be a deception. It could be a deception. If you were an agent, that's what you would do, right? Exactly right. So now you're getting to the place where you start asking what is paranoia, mm. right? So there's, there's a continuum of force, which means that there's a, there's a scale where you use increased force. So like saying stop and shooting someone in the chest. Those are two different uh, elements of force on a continuum from low force to high force. The same thing is true when it comes to security awareness. There's an awareness spectrum. The low end of that spectrum is critical thinking and critical awareness. The high end of that spectrum is paranoia, right? So the goal is to understand the scale so that you can always keep yourself on the lower end of the scale. So, you know, you didn't know how to get into the building either. I didn't know how to get into this building either. Right. So that makes me feel confident that you don't have total control over this building. But aren't those things that I would do if I were trying to fool you? Like if you're an agent, you you would do the same, wouldn't you? Now what you're now what you're doing is called meta processing. Okay. You're trying to think if I was this, then the other person would do this and they would think that it's like, uh, there's, yeah, it's like levels to the deception, like which goes against Occam's razor. Mm. Right. So, so I, as a professional, just to give you an example, I, as an actual professional would never pretend to be something I'm not because I increase the odds that I'm going to make a mistake. The more that I have to pretend, the more that I can be genuine, the less the odds are that I'm going to make a mistake. I thought the job is deception. though. The job is deception, but you control when the deception happens. Mm. Right. So consider, for example, uh, if you're if you're navigating through the woods, I don't know if you're a Boy Scout or if you grew up in the country. Anybody who's ever used a compass to navigate knows what I'm referencing. But when you're holding a compass, the compass needle might be three or five degrees off. It doesn't look like a big margin of error in your hand. But after you walk two miles, three degrees off heading, you're way off target. You've made a massive mistake. That's more of what the deception actually is. We use deception in small ways so that you can't really even tell that it's happening because we know that in the future, when the deception is being analyzed, you'll be so off track, you won't know where the deception happened. Rather than making large deception or large deceptive moves every step of the way, that makes good Hollywood movies, but Mm -hmm. that doesn't make for good actual operations. Yeah. Are you familiar with Yuri Benzinoff? Yeah. Did I say that right? Benzinoff? Um, what do you think about him? You think it's legitimate? I mean, it's dated. It's very old material. 84. But I mean, I've heard uh, certain Russians say he wasn't KGB. But I mean, what can't be denied is like the, the predictions were accurate, which is, I mean, strange, obviously. There is, I mean, the whole idea of social, and that's what we're talking about here is, is cultural subversion. Yeah. Right. The whole idea of cultural subversion is it's a classic psychological principle that makes academic sense. So he could have been making those predictions in the past and knowing that they were sociologically sound been fine. Doesn't necessarily mean he's KGB. He, and not only that, you've got to remember that in the, in the world of espionage, it's just like the world of business. People don't do just one thing, right? No operation. There is no singular operation. There's always multiple operations happening at the same time. So we create 10 operations in the hopes that two of them will be successful. And we already know eight of them will fail. So when you've got Yuri as an example, Yuri was one of probably 12 defectors that defected from Russia, mm-hmm. claiming to be KGB to come to the United States. Mm-hmm. He's, he, he could have been telling the truth or he could have just been spouting academic babble that maybe the Russians were thinking about, the Soviets were thinking about. But the point is now... 40 years later, 50 years later, we look back on that and we're like, oh my gosh, it was prescient. It was genius. When in fact, maybe it was just one out of 10 operations that nobody really knew if they would work or not. Mm. It just so happens that now that we sit where we sit culturally, we're looking for an explanation. It's the same concept as your conspiracy theory in reverse. 
we have a fact. The fact is that we live in a polarized world. What we don't know is why we live in a polarized world. So then we find this clip from 1970 something of a KGB asset who's defected saying, oh, the, the Soviets did this to you. And now we have something that explains the rationale as to why we're polarized. So then we stick to it. And now we have a conspiracy theory. So I know you got to head out. So this will be the last quick thing. What's your advice for finding a wife? <laughs> <laughs> I love that I'm getting asked that question, man, because there was there were very few things that I was more afraid of when I was younger than finding the right partner. And I that's mean, a concern. It's a serious it's concern. It's probably the biggest decision in your life. It absolutely. I mean, it's one of the most costly in terms of your time, your energy, and your actual finances. It's a fantastic, fantastic question. So um, I don't have a prepared answer. But what I will say is that I, I found my wife at CIA. Yeah. And she's brilliant. And she's hardworking. And I think she's absolutely beautiful. And I think the reason that our marriage has worked is because both of us had an honest conversation from the beginning about why we wanted to get married. It mm. wasn't because... How we, early? Like, let me think. We met in 2007. We got engaged in 2010. It was probably 2009. So within two years of us starting okay. to date, we had a very serious conversation to say, why do we want to be married? Like, are we getting married because it's what we're expected to do by society? Are we getting married? Like if we get married, is it because we want to, because we're expected to, because we want to have children, because we want to combine finances? Is it because we want to have some kind of security blanket in case the other person gets hurt? Like why, mm -hmm. why are we getting married? If you're not, if you're not comfortable talking to the person that you're dating about why they would want to get married or why they would want to marry you. They're not the right person mm. because all marriage is, is a series of very, very difficult conversations. So if you want to find the right partner, the right partner is a person that can handle a very uncomfortable conversation. Mm. If they can handle that and you can handle having it with them, there's hope for that to become a, a spouse. Yeah. If they can't handle that, there's no way in hell they're going to handle what spousal commitment will bring to the table. Mm, so it's like a pressure test. Absolutely. The willingness or ability to have difficult conversations. So there's two things. It's funny. There's two things that my wife and I joke we're going to force our children to do yeah. whenever they think they're getting serious with somebody. We're going to force them to travel abroad. It's huge. With their partner. We'll pay for it. Mm. Right. We'll be like, you know what? You guys get... Three weeks yeah. in your location of choice, right? You want to go to India? We're, we'll send you. You want to go to Paris? We'll send you. You, we, you want to go to Costa Rica? We'll send you. Because we want them to see what happens when you take all the comforts of life away. How does that person react under pressure? So that's one thing that we, we joke we're going to force our children to do. The other thing that we, that we joke we're going to force our children to do is live with us in the house for like a week. Right. Let your girlfriend or boyfriend come spend a week in our house living with us, not as a guest, mm -hmm. but as a member of the family. Mm. Right. What happens when they hear the two of us pass gas? What right. happens when they understand that, you know, we fight too? like, how do they handle that sort of reality? Because again, the goal is to just make it as real as possible because marriage is very, very real. Yeah navigating careers, navigating children, navigating the death of your parents. Yeah. Those are very real things. And if you have someone who's not up to the task, it's not going to, it's not going to go well. Yeah. Well, thank you, brother. Cause I know you got to head out. So I really appreciate your time. That was awesome. Really. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And, and I wish you tons of luck with this podcast, man. Cool. I think it's awesome what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it.